Yeah, hi, uh, welcome everyone uh, to my talk. Uh, so I'll just introduce myself first. Uh, so I'm Papnil Damal, currently uh, uh, a research engineer at Telecom Sud Paris in Ivry. Uh, I did my PhD in India in Indian Institute of Science. And since then, like I've been a postdoc in Telecom Sud Paris and a bit in Chal Chalmers, University and Chalmers University, Sweden, and also a little bit in, uh, in Ria Sophia Antipolis. Okay, so generally my uh, areas of uh, work are like in social networks, a bit of blockchain mining and transportation planning. Uh, so uh, today I'll be talking about a strategic computational investment in blockchain mining. Uh, so uh, basically this is this is like a two part uh, work uh, which has been published in uh, two journals. Uh, so, so one is the Journal of Parallel and Distributed Computing and the other is Annals of Operations Research. Uh, and this is like a joint work with uh, Balit Benamar and Tijani Chahir from Telecoms of Paris and uh, Ethan Altman, Albert Sani and Sudhir Pujari uh, who were in India at that time. Yeah, so just to give an, a basic introduction of uh, the distributed computing scenarios that we encounter in everyday life. Uh, so uh, generally, I mean, if you are aware of distributed computing, uh, what happens is that uh, there are some computational providers who provide their uh, computational power like it could be a CPU or it could be a memory or it could be anything. And then they get some kind of a reward in return in, in uh, mostly in the form of money. Okay. So, uh, so generally uh, I'll be focusing on two main applications here. Uh, for example, like one is blockchain mining, uh, where if you know that there are miners who uh, do some kind of mining and uh, basically if you know Bitcoin, like uh, the underlying architecture is uh, the blockchain mining itself. Uh, I'll, I'll give an introduction to that also. And then uh, the other application would be uh, volunteer computing, where basically the there are some volunteers who provide the computational power and they, they get some kind of uh, reward in return. Uh, so the two uh, scenarios that I'll be considering in this uh, talk are, uh, uh, so, so basically let me define a segment first. So a segment is nothing but uh, like the, um, the uh, portion of time uh, when the problem solving starts or till when it ends, okay? So for example, uh, if you are given a problem, uh, you start solving it. And when the, um, like from that time uh, till the time the problem gets solved, uh, you call it a segment, okay? So uh, so the two scenarios that I'll be talking about are uh, that the expected time of the segment is inversely proportional to the total power that is uh, being received for computing the problem. So this is like a very um, kind of generic because like, I mean, it's very intuitive because like the more power you uh, put into the solving the problem, the faster it will get solved, okay? So this is like one case. And the other case is where the expected time of uh, the segment is uh, a constant. So this could be applicable, for example, uh, when you give a certain problem and you say that uh, you, you solve it for one hour and then whatever the result is, give me that result, okay? So it's something like, um, it could be like a form of iteration, like you run for like 100 iterations and then uh, whatever result you get at, at the end of it, just give me that result. Okay? So in this case, uh, the expected time of a segment is a constant. And uh, the special, I mean, the, the, I mean, the novelty of our work is that here we consider that the computational providers uh, who are the players in this game, uh, they basically arrive and depart over time. And please, uh, you can interrupt me anytime, okay? Like if there is any question. Yeah. So um, uh, to give an introduction of blockchain mining, like uh, many of you may know it, but still I'll uh, give an introduction for those who may not know. Uh, so like it's nothing but like, um, like, like from the name itself, like it's a chain of blocks where each block consists of like a set of transactions. Uh, so generally in Bitcoin mining, it's something like these transactions are like monetary transactions where like uh, person A gives money to person B, et cetera. But, it, but these transactions could also be non-monetary, like. I mean, blockchains have been, I mean, they are being used for other applications also apart from a uh, cryptocurrency. So these transactions could be uh, anything, okay? Uh, so the way uh, this uh, blockchain uh, system works generally, uh, obviously like different systems have different um, ways of working, but like uh, I'll just show like the, this probably the one of the most uh, uh, primitive one when the blockchain started. So this is how it worked. So uh, it's like you you basically have some transaction which is initiated uh, like person A pays some money to person B. 
so the uh, transaction details are basically uh, broadcasted to the miners okay uh, the miners have the job of like taking this transaction and then basically uh, concretizing it and basically uh, accounting for it okay keep an account for it uh, so so once these uh, transactions are broadcasted to the miner the miners basically do some mining again i'll explain what that is uh, and once the mining is done they basically create uh, a block uh, the block is added to the uh, chain of blocks and uh, you basically have now uh, that block is basically a part of the blockchain okay so now that uh, transaction is uh, uh, so it is considered to be complete now and uh, we are interested in uh, this part of blockchain mining where uh, so basically as i said like my this miners do some kind of uh, mining basically putting in some computational power to uh, account for this transaction and adding this block to, to the uh, blockchain so here uh, once they do their do their work they basically get some kind of a monetary reward in return okay uh, so again like the system how this works also could be different in different blockchains uh, like for example if it's uh, if it's uh, a very competitive blockchain like where, where there are no mining pools there is like a competition and the person who solves the problem first gets all the money or if it's like a mining pool then uh, this money will be distributed among all the uh, contributors of computational power uh, so uh, to explain what exactly mining is, uh, so it, it's basically nothing but uh, kind of a cryptographic uh, 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 like way of uh, computing. So it's uh, so basically, as you can see here, mm -hmm. you basically have like a set of transactions. Okay, this uh, as I said, like the transactions are being broadcasted to the miners, and now they collect uh, all the set of uh, transactions uh, what they can collect. And once they have that, you basically uh, create a transactions hash. So this could be um, a hash created using some kind of cryptographic function. Okay. So you uh, collect this set of transactions uh, using a cryptographic hash function, create a transactions hash. And then because uh, because it's, you have to add it to the block, right? So you need to know uh, like the address of the previous block also, right? So that's why you create a hash of the previous block also. And then uh, the main objective of mining is basically to create a number here, uh, which is like a nonce, which is nothing but a number which is used only once. So that's a short form for that. Uh, so you basically have to create, uh, like find this particular number so that when you uh, concatenate all of this, okay, like the transactions hash uh, concatenated with previous blo boss, uh, block hash, concatenated with the, with the number that you find, uh, this entire uh, string should basically uh, result in a particular uh, block hash after using a, a crypto a crypto a graphic hash function f here okay uh, now uh, this is not a trivial problem because um, like obviously like if you do not have any condition on what a block hash should look like uh, this is a very trivial problem you can use like any number here uh, but the main difficulty comes in uh, because this block hash should satisfy certain constraints uh, like for example uh, you may have some kind of a target given here okay by the blockchain system that uh, the the hash that you find basically uh, the block hash that you see on the top here the one that you find it should not basically exceed a certain uh, target which is set by the system okay so it's possible that you uh, you basically uh, uh, create you basically find a number here okay and then it basically results in a block hash but it but it does not really satisfy the uh, constraint that it should be uh, less than the target value okay uh, so that's why you basically have to do it iteratively, like you just uh, keep on searching for uh, this number uh, so that after concatenating everything and applying the cryptographic hash function, uh, you get this uh, particular block hash which satisfies the constraints. Okay? And that's where um, the main difficulty of uh, blockchain mining lies. Um, so basically, I mean, you can imagine that. Uh, this is going to be like a very computationally intensive task because it's a very large uh, space it's a huge string and uh, you basically have to like the computer basically has to like go through like many many strings like, like millions of billions of strings and then you basically um, get the value which satisfies uh, the, the constraint okay and uh, the miners obviously like they they do not they are not actually uh, involved in computing i mean the computers are involved in computing but from the miners perspective, what it's like a black box from the miners perspective, like uh, the main input that they have is, I mean, obviously they have to buy the material, like uh, the computing material, et cetera. So that's like a fixed cost. 
But apart from that, the uh, dynamic cost is basically the amount of electricity that they spend, uh, basically for mining. Okay. So for from their perspective, it's like they are inputting uh, like the like some amount of electricity, and they they basically they uh, get some kind of reward in return. Okay, as an output. Uh, so from a miner's perspective, so basically all this mining thing is like a black box here. Yeah, so like another application, as I said, like uh, is uh, volunteer computing, which has been like since uh, like quite a long time ago. So, uh, so basically, it's like um, there is a publisher who basically has a problem to solve. Uh, so this problem is given to the server, and now the server basically distributes this a uh, problem. Um, um, like it basically splits uh, splits the problem uh, in different instances, and then um, basically this uh, individual instances are uh, solved by the uh, the volunteers. And then the partial results are basically um, aggregated by the server again, and then given to the publisher. And again here, like volunteers, basically they put in some kind of electricity or computational power, and they get uh, uh, some kind of monetary reward in return. So the main difference, um, generally, like if you do not consider the, the collaborative mining or the mining pool scenario, in blockchain mining, it's like a competitive thing. like. Um, you basically compete with other uh, compete with other miners so that you are the first one to solve the problem okay and in case of volunteer competing generally you are not really uh, competing directly you are basically collab collaborating so that you basically give your partial results some other um, players are also giving their partial results and uh, basically that is kind of contributing to solving the uh, problem as a whole Uh, so now that we have like a basic introduction of the applications, uh, I'll just go to a kind of the technical part. Uh, so th the main uh, concepts that we need here are stochastic game and Marco perfect equilibrium, which is uh, like a solution concept for stochastic games. Uh, so stochastic games are nothing but uh, basically they're like dynamic games uh, with published, uh, published transitions across different system states. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, many of you may be aware of this uh, Marco decision processes. So uh, like these stochastic games are nothing but like a multiplayer version of uh, Marco decision process, okay? So it's like uh, players are certain payoffs and there are state transition like in Marco decision processes. Uh, but but like uh, the decision of a player will not just depend on like how the system works. It will also depend on the, on the strategies of the other players. Okay? And then uh, like to analyze this uh, kind of games, we have a Marco perfect equilibrium, uh, where uh, like, again, like you may be aware of Nash equilibrium, for example. So there um, you may be knowing that, um, like generally Nash equilibrium is nothing but um, like in, in a Nash equilibrium, a player's uh, strategy is a best response to the other player strategies, right? Uh, similarly in Marco perfect equi uh, equilibrium also, the policy that you have, it's basically a best response to the other players marker mark perfect, perfect equilibrium policies. And um, yeah, basically again, like um, just like MD, MDP policy, you have MPE policy, uh, which kind of defines a function uh, describing the player strategy uh, for each state. And again, uh, you ignore uh, whatever happened, whatever, whatever happened in the past, you just consider what is uh, there in the current state. Uh, uh, to give an overview of the related work, um, so basically, there have been uh, game theoretic studies for distributed systems, uh, including uh, blockchain mining. Um, like to just give an example. So basically, you have, um, for example, there is a there is kind of blockchain mining going on. Okay, like people are uh, mining the blocks and adding it to the chain. Okay, and there could be like an attacker or some kind of a malicious person uh, who basically is. So ideally, in blockchain systems. When you solve the problem, you are ideally supposed to broadcast uh, the block which you have, uh, which you have formed, so that the other uh, miners see that uh, block and then try to uh, mine the next block. Okay, so that is how the ideal system should work. Uh, but what an attacker could do is that uh, uh, basically the attacker is possible that it solves the problem very fast. Okay, and then it does not want to broadcast uh, this block to the other miners. Um, because if, if because it, if it broadcasts, what could happen is the other miners would so, start solving. So what this miner tries to do is uh, it keeps the block to uh, himself or herself, and then uh, basically it will try to uh, start solving for the next block, okay, uh, without uh, broadcasting the previous block. Uh, so this is uh, one kind of attack which could ha happen. 
uh, that there are other miners who are trying to solve the problem. The first problem itself, this attacker has solved the first problem and is proceeding to the second problem. So this, this is like one kind of attack. There could be multiple types of attacks. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then the other types of work are regarding the stochastic games um, in blockchain mining. Uh, so as I said, like the novelty in our work is that we consider that the players will arrive and depart over time. Uh, so there have been stochastic games in the literature, but not where players arrive and depart over time. Uh, basically, in our case, the states are going to be like the set of players uh, present in the system. But in the literature, generally, they have been like the state. A uh, state basically signifies uh, the state of the chain of blocks. Okay, like uh, I mean, as you can imagine, this uh, blockchain is actually keeping. I mean, it keeps on changing over time, right? As the blocks are getting added, etc. So basically, in that case, uh, the states are basically signifying uh, the like how the blockchain looks like. Uh, so uh, coming to some uh, notation that uh, I'll use through the, throughout this talk. Uh, so uh, let's consider you as the universal set of uh, players. Okay. So actually we consider two types of players here. One is the strategic players and uh, the other set of players are the fixed players. So fixed players you can imagine as um, in blockchain mining, they could be like large mining firms who basically do not really care about like uh, what is the amount of computational power, power they're putting this hour or this day. They are just like buying a like huge uh, uh, computational machines and then just keeping it running, okay, and and not basically looking at how much computational power is being invested. Uh, so that is like the constant am amount of power, and that's where uh, they also do not really arrive and depart over time. I mean, obviously they will arrive and depart over time when you consider a very large time frame, uh, but when you consider like small time frames, like maybe a week or a day, so basically it it, it keeps almost uh, constant. And then, uh, yeah, so let you be the set of strategic players, uh, which uh, which do not include this uh, fixed uh, players. And then uh, let S be the system state. Uh, basically here state is nothing but the set of strategic players uh, which are currently present in the system. And L is the constant amount of power which is invested by the fixed players. And then uh, let R be uh, the reward parameter. So in Bitcoin mining, for example, the reward given now is uh, 6.25 bitcoins uh, like per block and uh, uh, actually it keeps on decreasing as uh, like as the computational becomes more and more difficult so uh, currently the reward is set to be like 6.25 uh, bitcoins uh, which is like um, almost uh, like 170,000 euros okay roughly and uh, ci is uh, nothing but the cost incurred by player i uh, when it invests a unit amount of power for unit amount of time so you can imagine it as like a constant of proportional, proportionality. And then lambda i and mu i are the arrival and departure rates of uh, like of the player i. Uh, and delta be the discounting factor. Uh, like, uh, I mean, I mean similar to MDP, like you have some kind of delta factor there, right? Like you um, value the current utility uh, as like full value and the next, next utility that you will get, uh, you will basically discount it by a factor of delta. Uh, so similarly here, like, in blockchain mining for yeah. So uh, could you explain uh, so I mean players arrive, but what is a departure in this case? So what does it mean to depart? Oh okay, like in uh, blockchain mining, like uh, you will not keep your computer on like forever, right? Like even even when you come, you will start the mining. But you will have to turn off the computer sometime, for example. Okay. Mm -hmm. So so we are considering like small players here, okay? So not necessarily like big machines. Uh, so those are like constant power. So we are accounting them as constant power, the big machines, which are never turned off. So here we consider like uh, small players. Okay. But I mean, you had a scheme where you were explaining that the, the mining was a process with the beginning and certain number of uh, actions and then an end. Mm -hmm. So, so, so this this departure is oblivious of that. So that you, um, you stop mining after a while. So I'm not sure to understand it. Uh, are you talking about this thing? Or... Uh, yeah, right. The, okay. When the transaction is complete. You transaction is complete. Okay. Oh, okay. So. From, uh, from mm -hmm. Yes. So basically, here when we are uh, saying arrival and departures, it's for these players. Okay. 
Uh, so for this individual players, not for the system. Okay. Yeah, so it's like uh, these players are kind of competing with each other. Okay, like they want to solve the problem. To, they want to be the first to solve the problem. And these players are actually arriving and departing over time. But the blockchain system itself is always running. Yes. Um, yeah. So as I said, like this discounting factor is nothing but you you value the future uh, blocks, the utility that you get from the future blocks, you basically discount it by a factor. And then uh, we have the strategies uh, of the players here, where uh, like XIS is nothing but uh, the power investment, uh, a strategy of player I in status, basically how much power it's going to invest in status. Yeah, this then we have this uh, vector XS, which is nothing but the strategy profile of the players in the state S. Basically, it will kind of uh, it will basically capture the strategies of all the players in in the status, and then X is the policy profile, which will kind of capture uh, uh, the strategies of all the players uh, for all the states. Okay, so it's kind of the entire uh, strategy, like the entire policy profile of the game. Yeah, so um, so in, in these studies, we basically make certain assumptions. Uh, so which are simplifying assumptions, but also not impractical, like they, they could be justified in practice or practice also. For example, uh, we consider memoryless property of computation. So what this means is that, uh, so whenever you are uh, doing some kind of computation, you, are, you don't really uh, keep uh, track of what kind of computation you have done earlier. Uh, for example, in blockchain mining, like you have a large search space and you have to uh, find a particular number, which is like very rare, okay? It's not something that is like, so, so the fraction of the those numbers which you want to find it's actually like very very small. It's it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost negligible. So there is no need to really keep track of like which numbers you already seen so far. Okay. So so that's why you basically just keep on searching randomly until you kind of hit hit a number which basically satisfies the certain constraints. Uh, so that's why we assume that uh, uh, computation is memoryless, and then also we consider Markovian players. So what again this means is that uh, uh, these are the players who uh, do not really care, care about what action they have taken in the past. Uh, they just care about like, they, they just want to maximize uh, the utility that you're, that they're going to get in the future, okay? Uh, so like ignoring the past, ignoring what kind of reward they have received, ignoring the cost they've incurred uh, earlier. Uh, they are just basically looking at the future and trying to maximize whatever they can get from here on, like from now onwards. Yes, and then uh, like, uh, like like as I said, uh, we are considering these two types of scenarios where uh, the expected time of the segment is inversely proportional to the um, like the total computational power or it's a constant. Uh, so these are the like the mathematical forms of, of those uh, scenarios. So the, in the first scenario, you have that the rate of the problem getting solved is like proportional to the total amount of power that is being invested by the players, okay? So including the constant players. So, um, like again, like so, so again, like this is the most intuitive kind of case where uh, the more computation you put, the faster the problem gets solved. And the second scenario is the case where you basically have a certain amount of time till which you want to solve the problem and then get whatever solution uh, you have. So here, um, so here, uh, the rate of problem getting solved uh, is a constant. So we just denote it by uh, beta constant. And then. Um, we have this ri, uh, which, is, which is a function of s and x. So here, it's nothing but uh, player i's expected utility uh, that is computed in state s under policy profile x. Uh, so uh, it's important to note that even though it is computed in state s, it does not necessarily mean that uh, uh, this is the utility that you will get only in state s, okay? So when you're computing this utility, you're actually also accounting for the state transitions that are going to happen. Uh, so like you're in state s now, some players could arrive and depart, et cetera. Uh, you're actually accounting for those, uh, those kind of things also. Uh, and to just give kind of uh, the schema of the, um, like how the continuous time macro chain looks like. So like you have a state S here, uh, like if you solve the problem, uh, and as you have seen earlier, it, it basically so gets solved with this uh, gamma. So you basically stay in the same state because the players are not arriving and departing there. The problem is just getting solved, okay? 
so the state does not change uh, but uh, like a player i could arrive with like rate lambda and then the state could like there could be a state transition to su and ni also a player could depart uh, with rate rate mu j in which case uh, the state the state transition will be to like s minus j Uh, and to and to uh, proceed further, uh, like to arrive at our utility function, we will just need like a few properties of exponentially distributed random variables. Uh, you may all you may all be aware of this that if you have like m independently distributed uh, like exponentially distributed variables, then the minimum of uh, these variables is nothing but they it it will have parameter which is nothing but the sum of the rates of the original random variables. Okay. And also the probability that a random variable is uh, the minimum is proportional to its rate. Uh, and as you can see here that uh, when you are going to consider the probability that uh, xi is minimum, it is it is going to be like lambda the rate uh, corresponding to this i divided by the sum of all the rates. Okay, uh, so you will encounter this denominator, this sum of all the rates uh, throughout the utility function. Uh, so like as I said, like here, as you can see that from status, you will have mainly this gamma and you will have like many lambdas, lambdas and lambda j's, okay? So this is what we are going to get in the denominator, the sum of all the rates are corresponding to status. Uh, let's call this a common denominator B. And then uh, let's consider the other terms. So the first term basically corresponds to the case uh, where player I uh, is basically able to mine the block, okay? So that means it's, it's able to solve the problem of uh, mining the block before everyone else. And uh, since uh, like this is like a randomized search, okay? So the more computational power you have, the like the more you are going to search uh, in a particular am amount of time. So here uh, you basically will have that the success probability of player i is nothing but the computational power put in by player i divided by the total computational power that is being put in. And corresponding to this probability, we will have uh, the player I will get a reward of R if it is like given that it is able to solve the problem. And also for the future blocks, we have this delta multiplied by uh, the the utility that is going to get for the future blocks. Okay. Again, as you can see, like this is a recursive equation. So this R I, you basically have the first term corresponding to the player I being able to solve the problem multiplied by um, the reward for this block plus delta multiplied by kind of the utility for the future block. And uh, then you will have like other set of, uh, like the other term where the player I is not able to solve the problem before everyone else. Okay, so basically there is some other competitor who was able to successfully solve the problem before player I. So that is like just nothing but a one minus the previous probability that we saw uh, multiplied by like, so the player I will get zero for this block because it did not solve the problem. And, but still like it will have chance to solve future problem, right? So you will have Delta multiplied by the utility for the future block. Yes. So how is it that the utility functions already a fixed point equation? Because R is implicit, you said, so could you explain? Um... No, actually we have to prove that uh, this is going to converge. Uh, so basically, this is like. Uh, so your question is why is it a, why is it a fixed point, right? Yes. Right. Yes. So that's what like we cannot assume it. Ah. We have to prove it. You will prove it. So we, not in the stock actually, but it can be proved. Okay. Okay. But is it lead to some? I mean, is it really the game? It's the stochastic game itself, or is it a midfield approximation or fixed point? I mean, what yeah, is the nature so, of this equation? Yes, so actually uh, it's going to be a stochastic game. Like it's not going to be mean field. I mean, yes, but uh, to explain our simulations, we are going to use mean field approximation. Uh, yes, so basically we are going to solve the stochastic game as it is, okay, without using mean field. So our theoretical analysis is based on uh, uh, solving the stochastic game, okay, without mean field. And then we will have simulations. And to explain uh, the results of the simulations, we will use mean field. So, we, so it's not a necessity, just like uh, uh, for explanation, we are going to use mean field. But for all the theoretical analysis, we are not going to use mean field. Okay. Uh, 
So the, 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 your setting of stochastic gain leads without the midfield to an equation of yes. the utility, yes. which is in terms of it. That's yes, exactly. Yes. And you will explain. Uh, the thing, actually, the thing is, I'll not go through the proofs here. Okay. Actually, if you're interested, we can discuss later or actually it's there in the papers also. Yeah. Just to understand. Yeah. Yes. So basically, it can be shown that this converges and then to what it converges. Okay. Yes. And then, and then there, there is basically this uh, cost term, which is nothing but CI, as I said, like it's a cost uh, per unit amount of power per unit amount of time. X is the amount of power and one divided B is the expected amount of time, uh, like the sojourn time that uh, player I will, uh, sorry, the sojourn time that the system will be in status before any state transition occurs. Uh, so, yeah, so, so, so these are the, these were all the terms corresponding to like the current block in, in the current state in some way. And then obviously there could be state transitions, right? Like if some player arrives, then you will basically have if lambda, the probability that player j arriving before any other event occurs, it will be like lambda j divided by the common denominator and multiplied by the utility that you will get in that state. Okay, the state where you will have s along with the player j arriving. And similarly, we will have um, like an other set of uh, terms where we have like player j departing, who is uh, like the player j if it is in state s. And if it departs, uh, so what kind of uh, utilities you are going to get? Okay, so there is a term corresponding to that. And uh, as you can see here, like there are like two types of terms. So one, like the first three terms here correspond to the uh, current state. And in the last two terms basically correspond to the uh, future, like the other states, okay, corresponding to the state transitions. Uh, so here we will have like a, a state transition matrix uh, where uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's nothing but like um, the, you will have W S comma S union J just means that like what is the probability of you going from state S to state S union J? Okay, so so this is this is like similar to what we saw here. It is just kind of put in a matrix form, and then the first three terms that we saw they were correspond to the they corresponded to the uh, current state. So here we have the a state wise reward cost vector. Where you will have so so this you can imagine as it's like um, utility if you ignore all the state transition okay so what kind of utility player I will get if uh, you kind of ignore the state transitions so this is uh, what we will get and then um, yeah basically like like uh, whatever equation like whatever recursive equation we are seeing here it can be written in matrix form like this. And uh, like actually to answer your question, right, about the uh, convergence, I, I mean, here like um, like this W is like substochastic sub, sub and then like it can prove that it will go here. Like all the steps are missing here, okay, but that is the idea. Yeah, uh, now I'll just uh, go to the result. I mean, if you are actually interested in the proof, uh, I mean, they are in detail in the paper, okay? And uh, obviously, uh, we can discuss also about the topic if you're interested. And so, yeah, so for uh, proving the result, uh, they, we need uh, some lemmas. So first lemma is that, uh, like, if you're in any state S, and if, if you know the policy profile X, uh, then given that the player high I's uh, cost parameter is less than gamma, which is the concept of proportionality for the system, multiplied by the reward that is being offered. So uh, if it satisfies uh, this particular constraint, then the expected utility that the player is going to get is going to be upper bounded by a certain quantity. And similarly, if the cost parameter is greater than that particular um, threshold value, then uh, your expected utility that you, can get, that you are computing in status, it is basically lower bounded by a certain value. And the second lemma that will be necessary is uh, that uh, the utility that player I computes in status given the policy profile X, it is a monotone function of XI. So it's it could be monotone increasing or decreasing, okay? So it is uh, not necessarily known, but uh, like for example, if it's monotone increasing for player I uh, for any status, then it is monotone increasing for player I for all these states, okay? 
And using these two lemmas, like again, uh, I'm not really explaining like the intermediate steps here. So the final result is this, that if uh, if the cost parameter of player i is lower than a threshold, that little, then it will invest the, the maximum power that, is ha that it has. If it is greater than the threshold, it will invest no power. And if it is exactly equal to the threshold, then it will invest like any amount of power. So it does not matter to the player. Uh, so like, uh, like as far as far as we know, it's like we kind of uh, model the game using uh, quite like realistic assumptions, okay? And we have arrived at a conclusion that uh, the player strategies are kind of independent of the arrival and departure rates. Obviously, we have seen that the utilities are definitely not independent of the arrival and departure rates, okay? Like uh, as you see here in the final equation, we have this W which obviously has the lambdas and mu's. And so the utilities defi are definitely dependent on arrival and departure rates. But the players' uh, MP strategies, uh, they're basically independent of these rates. Uh, so like um, it can basically be understood by, by just saying that if you have a CI less than a, that threshold what we had uh, told earlier. So in this case, uh, if you are investing more power, then I mean, it can be it can be seen that this W matrix, the values of the elements of this those that matrix, they decrease, and so this I minus W inverse also decreases, and uh, yeah, there is also like an increasing in the increase in the Z. I mean, just to revise here like, that we have this R, uh, which is the expected utility of player I, given the policy profile X. So it is uh, nothing but like the product of this I minus W inverse and Z. Okay. And we see that the I minus W inverse will decrease and Z will increase. But from the result, we can conclude that the increase in Z is definitely dominating the decrease in this I minus W inverse. Uh, so again, like, um, I mean, this is an interesting result in the sense that um, this is like, I mean, as far, I mean, obviously the model could be improved, uh, but we have considered like uh, more or less very realistic assumptions and we have arrived at this conclusion, okay? That you do not really need to care about the player's uh, arrival and departure rates when you compute the strategy. And uh, I'm just to give an intuition like how the uh, utilities, uh, sorry, how the yeah how the uh, utilities will look like uh, in a limiting case. Okay, so if uh, if the strategic players kind of dominate the computation of the fixed players, uh, basically in that case you kind of ignore the presence of fixed players altogether. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, we, we can actually see that uh, the, in the limiting case, the utility will take this particular form. Uh, so again, like it's intuitive because we have this uh, R divided by the number of players present in the current state. Where uh, so again, it's like if all if all the strategic players have equal amount of, amount of power, then they're, they're kind of kind of computing very fairly. Okay, like if if maybe. So the probability of any player winning is kind of one divided by the number of players current in the status currently. So we have this reward gets distributed equally, uh, like in expectation, okay? And then you have uh, uh, the CI divided by, uh, so again, like uh, in this case, uh, the rate of problem getting solved is proportional to the total amount of power put in, right? So, and the total amount of power put in is like proportional to the number of players here. So we will have gamma multiplied by the number of players. And so that is like the a rate of problem getting solved and one divided by that is basically the expected time for solving the problem. So see what CI divided by that just means that uh, the more the players, I mean, if you have more players in the system, the problem gets solved, solved faster. And so the cost incurred by the player is also lower because you are spending the power for less amount of time. And this uh, one by one minus delta is nothing but like uh, the geometric series, okay, like one plus delta plus delta square. Uh, that's some. Okay, how much time do I have? Uh, yeah, so um, now to, to look at some, uh, like as we saw, uh, the result is that uh, the uh, MP strategies of the players, they're basically independent of the arrival and departure rates, okay? So, even though it is interesting in some sense, it's not really exciting. Okay. So what we want to see is, I mean, what we've seen from the uh, formulation is that definitely utilities will depend on the arrival and departure rates. Okay. So that's why we will consider uh, 
like now we go to some uh, simulations here um and again for practical practical like implementation okay we cannot really consider um all the place to be heterogeneous otherwise we will have like exponential uh, state space okay like the size of the state space will be exponential so we consider a homogeneous case here where all the players will have the same arrival and departure rates and then the um this particular system will kind of be equivalent to an exit system where we will have like a fixed pop, uh, a fixed population size and then like players are having to part over time okay so that uh, the total number of players in the system does not exceed a particular number capital n and in that case uh, like it is basically shown in the exit formula that the probability that the number of players present in the system is s is nothing but like given by this particular formula yeah this is nothing but like a binomial term in some sense so yeah and also it is shown that the probability that a given player is present is uh, lambda divided by lambda plus mu and again like because the players are homogeneous it's same for all the players and the probability that that given player is absent is mu divided by mu divided by lambda plus mu so uh, for our simulation study we actually consider three types of utilities uh, so it's possible that the player is currently present in the system okay like ideally we will have like uh, many states in heterogeneous case where, where we will have like uh, i am present with uh, set of players a i am present with set of players b etc but when you are just considering like from your own point of view and suppose you do not do not know the like in which state the system is the only thing that you know is whether you yourself are present are present or not okay so that's why we have this r contains is nothing but expected utility that the player is currently present in the system and r not contains is the expected utility uh, given that the player is absent from the system and again like this is not only for the current state uh, this utility is computed like foreseeing what is going to happen in the future okay so what kind of state transitions are going to happen etc and this r with angular brackets is nothing but the overall expected utility which is uh, like if, if you if you are really agnostic about like even whether you are present or not okay suppose you have just kept a computer for running and maybe it just randomly switches on switches off the program etc so if you are agnostic about even your presence then you will have like an over or overall expected utility yeah so uh, coming to like how the results will look like in this case uh, so here we are looking at like how um, the lambdas and mu mu values how they affect uh, the r contains uh, value okay i mean to recollect r contains is the expected utility utility when the player knows that it is present so so basically the idea like i mean why you observe this kind of curves is that uh like for example if you are present in the system okay and if the value of lambda is higher then uh, what it means is that more players are likely to enter the system okay and that is going to mean like uh, higher competition and higher competition means kind of a, a lower utility for the player okay the probability of it uh, solving the problem is going to reduce so that's why it's, it kind of uh, decreases as lambda increases but when it comes to mu like if you are currently present in the system and uh, like mu is increasing okay so that means that the players are departing that means the competition is getting reduced so you are kind of uh, happy that there are going to be less players present in the system uh, to compete with uh, but if lambda cross if this mu crosses certain threshold value uh, actually the probability of the player itself departing also kind of increases okay and in that case it's bad for the player because now it will also leave the system so that's why we uh, we observe this kind of trend here and for uh, and for the case where the player knows that it is currently absent uh, from the system uh, if lambda increases it's what it means is that uh, i mean if if like if you recollect it's like the more play players that are present in the system the faster the competition is going to happen okay so if lambda increases that means there are more players getting added to the system it's it's likely that the problem is going to get solved very fast okay and you are currently absent okay so that means it's possible that that the problem may get solved even before you enter the system so that's why the utility kind of decreases but after a certain point if lambda is quite high it's possible that you yourself are going to enter the system okay and so that's why your your utility increases 
and similarly like you have a similar trend for mu like uh, uh, so currently you are absent from the system and uh, then mu is getting reduced so that means the computation is getting slower okay in the system while you are absent so that means um, it is very it is less likely that the problem is going to get solved before you enter the system okay? so that's why your utility kind of increases and again like whatever i said is like just from observations okay i could not really uh, like by default say that this is going to happen okay so it, it's very really not so convincing to really give this kind of statements right like why this cause occurred so that's why i mean especially like uh, where this minima occurs i mean that's obviously not very clear so that's why in that case that's why we need to uh, have some kind of main field approximation to explain uh, our results here so like uh, i mean it, actually we do not have closed form expressions for this r contains r does not, do not contain okay um, and because we do not have closed form expressions it's very difficult to understand how the curves are going to look like so that's why to get some closed form expressions and approximation of that uh, we use some kind of mean field approximation so here we will have just two states where uh, player i is present in the system and player i is not present in the system okay and then in both the cases the problem may get solved uh, and that's how this uh, we have this gamma where that is the rate of problem getting solved and uh, yeah so that's all basically that is a kind of a collapsed form of our uh, continuous uh, marco chain and we can now solve this marco chain very easily okay because we just have like two uh, two main states i mean those upper states are not really state they are just saying that uh, whether the problem is solved when the player is present or not yeah, and we can uh, simply solve this uh, continuous time Marco chain and then get this uh, results. So, the, yeah. it's, 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 uh, how the mean field is, I mean, uh, oh, yes, yes, I mean, just yes. I mean, how you define the mean field. Oh, yes, sure, sure. What is the uh, parameter? Yes. Uh, so, basically, uh, so now we have like n states, okay, corresponding to the players, uh, uh, like. Uh, so sorry, we will have approximately two end states where we will have like player being present when there are n players and player being absent when there are n players. Okay. And now uh, all the end states where we have player being present, so that corresponds to this uh, uh, state on the left, and the other set of uh, states where the player is absent that corresponds to the uh, right state. Okay. And now what we know is that if uh, yeah, so if if the system is in this, this state, okay, this R contains, and the player is going to depart with this rate mu, okay, this particular player which you are considering, then it will then the system will basically transit to that other state. And similarly, if the player arrives, it will basically transit to this first state. Okay. Yeah. So that is a basic uh, state space here only. And then yeah, you basically will have when you are in this R contained state, uh, the problem is getting solved with this uh, uh, so again, to recollect this gamma is nothing but a constant of proportionality, where the rate of problem get, getting solved is gamma times the total amount of power. Okay, the total amount of power here is, I mean, because of the theorem that we have, it's like uh, you are going to invest maximum amount amount of power always if you satisfy that constraint, and we assume this to be x bar for all the players because it's homogeneous. Okay, and this n is nothing but the expected number of players which are present in the system. And, n is, and by the exact formula, this n is nothing but lambda by lambda plus mu multiplied by the total population. Okay. So basically, you can imagine gamma as kind of the expected um, uh, rate of problem getting solved over the entire system, including the state transitions, etc. So, what I'm trying to understand, so I mean, there are mean fields. Um, Approximations for games, the midfield approximations for macro chains, which are coupled. Mm -hmm. This is the latter, right? Or what type of I mean, what type of midfield? Uh... I don't know really how to classify it. Uh, okay. Yeah. Right. It's just that, uh, yeah, it can be solved. In, yeah, I don't know really how to classify it. Right. So it's just representing a transition rate uh, yes. as uh, some expectation. Uh, yes. Yes. So basically, here the, the rate of problem problem getting solved is like overall rate of problem getting solved, including like if you consider that expected number of players are present in the system. Okay. 
and the expected number of players playing in the system and is given by that thing set formula. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the um, yeah, basic idea. Right. So, but uh, is there an interpretation of when, the, say, the number of players goes to infinity or something like that? Or? You mean this capital N? Yeah. yeah. Uh, or it's just, it just a heuristic in terms of you replace something. Is there is it a limit of some uh, large system like in certain big field theory or just a heuristic way of representing? Uh... Yeah. So this yeah again I don't know where to put the threshold, but yes, this capital N should be large enough so that the effect of arrival and departure of one player does not really matter. Again, like I don't think so. We can really quantify how much that should be. Yeah, but it's like. Uh, because we are assuming here that uh, the number of players n, uh, the expected number of players, is not really changing whether the player is present or not, whether one player is present or not. Okay, that's why we have this gamma n in, in both the cases, whether irrespective of whether the player is present or not. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I mean we can basically solve this uh, continuous time macro chain, and we can get some kind of close form approximations and. Yeah, we basically validated that these are really very good approximation. Like the percentage error is actually like 0.001% or something. So it actually performs really well. Okay. When we consider like capital N is like, you know, around 12,000. Uh, and this 12,000 number we, we got uh, from a typical blockchain system. Um, uh, li like, yeah, like there, is, there was like, a, there, there is actually a website which basically kind of keeps track of this uh, who, who all is solving the problem. And there was a time when it was like 12,000, so you basically took that number. And with that number, and uh, so you basically get that these are really good uh, approximations. Uh, how much time? Like two minutes. <laughs> yes, so actually, I have you, I think. Uh, it's actually very similar to the first scenario in. Uh, like the concepts are very, very similar. Just that the results are like, they're not really thresholding type result. Like they, they are not just saying that if you cross a particular threshold, you, you invest maximal amount of power. Here you, here, you, here you will have some kind of continuous trend okay, in the investment. So the investment is kind of given by some formula here. And it's uh, important to know that the investment will basically kind of depend on uh, the total amount, so size nothing but the total amount of power which is being put in by all the players okay, in the system. So you need to know that. And uh, uh, in, in the first scenario, you did not even need to know like how much player, how much power is going to be put by that players. Okay, but here you need to know that, and probably this uh, this needs to be kind of made public by the volunteer computing system. Yeah, again, like we have some observation and I'll just like spend a minute over this. Uh, so till now we just saw uh, the game between the miners okay, or the computational providers. Uh, but in this part, we basically also consider the game from the uh, center's perspective, okay, the system. Uh, so the basically the center who is kind of giving away the reward. Okay. Uh, so it has to divide like how much it has to decide how much reward to give. So like again, like we can actually um, Yeah, it can actually be shown that, uh, like here, uh, let psi s be the total amount of power that is being uh, received by the center when the system has s number of players, for example. And again, this p is the exit probabilities. And uh, yeah, we can define some kind of utility for the center where if it is giving away a reward of r for a segment or a block, then uh, basically we can define it like as an increasing function of. Uh, the amount of power that is, being, that is being received by the center, which is again very intuitive, and sub, and minus uh, the amount of reward that it is giving away, so it's losing that uh, money. So we can define this utility function, and then using a particular form of this utility function, we can actually kind of get some kind of uh, curves also. Like we can we can actually observe like what should be the optimal reward that should be set by the center so that its utility is maximized. And again, like even this also can be it also can be explained using a mean field approximation corresponding to this uh, setting. Uh, I mean, yeah, just to uh, tell about the drawbacks of this study and also like uh, the future directions. Uh, like one possible drawback could be like to actually um, 
we need to actually model how actually this arrival and departures happen in real life. And uh, so we had some certain assumptions. They may or may not be satisfied. And also like we had um, certain assumptions, like, like for example, the rate of problem getting solved is proportional or, or it's constant. So there could be like other settings also. And uh, yeah, there could be other settings where, uh, like as you saw the results were uh, in the sense, um, I mean, bo in both the scenarios, we actually observed that the uh, strategies of the players were not dependent on the arrival and departure of players, okay? So the thing is, uh, and, and this is true, even, even though we consider like what we thought is a very practical scenario, okay? And also we justified that, but uh, there could be scenarios, for example, where uh, the cost incurred by a player is not just proportional to the amount of power, but maybe it is a, it's some other function of it. And in that case, uh, maybe there is a possibility that uh, uh, the strategies may depend on the arrival and departure rates. Uh, so yeah, we have not studied that case. Yeah, yeah, that's all for the time. Thank you.